and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis, and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. What can we learn from their incredible journeys as we explore some of the key issues around equality in sport and beyond? A massive thank you to our partners, Sport England, who support The Game Changers podcast through the National Lottery. It's been a pretty incredible rise to international rugby for my guest today, Shauna Brown. Shauna only started playing the game at 25 and two years later, she had her first international cap. Before rugby, Shauna had a career in athletics where she represented England at Hammer in the 2014 Commonwealth Games. Her fascinating career path has seen her as a gas engineer, a commercial diver and a firefighter. She joined Harlequins in 2016, made her England debut in 2017 and went on to receive a full-time contract with the Red Roses in 2019. So Shauna, let's start with last night. It was the premiere of No Woman No Try, an incredible new Amazon Prime film about women's rugby in which you have a starring role. (laughs) So how did it feel to see yourself on the big screen? It was was overwhelming, mainly, but then there's a part of me that thinks these things are always in my head. Like it's very easy for me to talk about these subjects and and I'm sitting there watching it. I go, she's right. Like talking about myself, I go, she's right. Yeah, she she knows. And I found myself like agreeing with myself, which is a you know is a good place to be because I it's genuinely what I believe. Like, and I never never have a script for these things. And for me, it's a consistent message that I like to give across the whole time. And and it's truly genuinely me. And you know, it's very easy for me to be me. <laughs> and can you tell us a little bit about the documentary and what it explores? Yeah. So so the headline of it or, or the subtitle is it's not a rugby story but a human one and even afterwards like speaking about it with different people how relatable the whole journey was and like so many issues that we discuss and differences between how men and women are treated in sport how we're financially differently supported and when I say differently obviously I mean lesser supported some people you know not even knowing we exist as a team not even knowing that women play rugby but then also the other side of it is once once you're in there you've got the kit issues you've got what coaches we're given and and you know and it's not talking about me and my club specifically but you know I go to a lot of rugby clubs and you see the widely different standards and you know there's clubs in the prem who are still not really in line with their men's teams if clubs at top level are not there yet what hope has the community level got but it's 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 about having good people around us and encouraging them to do the right thing and you know the people making these decisions and again this is what we talk about in the film is having those honest conversations and and as a woman if somebody asks you like what what could we fix like be honest yes women's rugby is in is in a good place it's in an okay place and it's going in the right direction but there's a hell of a long way to go and so just be honest because I can assure you there's a lot of people at the top tables of any of these rugby clubs that have no idea of our struggles like Steph Evans talks about kit for me that's that's one of the most powerful pieces and how constantly she's told well we don't need to buy a women's kit because we just, we can only afford one type of kit in terms of batches, numbers, and, you know, all all that sales stuff. And she goes, okay, fine. Well, why don't you just buy all women's kit? And they say, well, that's ridiculous. And she goes, exactly. So it's just those, those real life, like hard truths that hit home and you just think, Oh yeah. Like I've literally, I've never thought about it like that before. So this, this film is just all about getting people thinking and, as women in rugby, we, we know all this stuff and, and this is our everyday. But what we need to do is get people who aren't necessarily rugby players like watching it and, and realising this is almost everyone's struggle. And Hugo Monnier also features in the film, a, a former guest on The Game Changers. And there's some really lovely interaction between the two of you. Clearly, he's a big supporter uh, of your career. But when I spoke to him on the podcast, he did say he wouldn't want his own daughters to play rugby right now as a setup for professional players isn't yet good enough. Did, does that surprise you to hear him say that? Uh, short answer, no, it doesn't because Hugo is a very honest person and he is, he is within the sort of women's game. And I, I speak to him personally and like we have phone calls and chats about things and it's almost, he's getting, he's getting so on board that me and and like other women when we hear it these things don't surprise them anymore like when we hear about the different standards and you know hearing about people who who go to work eight nine hours a day and and come to training 
So he he's now in a place where he's defending it as well. And, and it'll be on pitch and someone will moan that, oh, there's like four balls dropped in that game. That's disgraceful. These are professional players, number one. You know, they aren't. But number two, they might have dropped four balls, but they've also done a 42-hour working week and come to training. And, and as a team, as a, as a club team, we get about three hours rugby together a week. And as you can imagine, like three hours in a week to play premiership level of rugby is not a lot of time. So, you know, so, something's got to give. But no, it, it doesn't surprise me that Hugo is being more and more honest about it because, you know, w- when a giant like Hugo speaks, people listen. And this is what we need to encourage more and more people to not only realise that our, our struggles and our issues, but to say them out loud. And again, just get people at the top who can make these changes and differences, get them listening because I fully in full belief that if they know how bad we have it sometimes, they will want to do something about it. But at the moment, they, they just don't know because not enough people are saying it out loud. Brilliant. Brilliant to hear. And, and in terms of male allies, do you think the men's game and male players can do more? For sure. Men and male players can do more because like rugby is seen as a, is a man sport uh, and particularly as a, a white middle class man sport. So there's like so many different angles, even just in that, that people can, can make a difference. And, you know, someone like me from Peckham in South London, grew up single mom, went to a uh, non-fee paying school. Like just me talking about rugby all of a sudden then puts it into the minds of other people who, who grew up in a similar situation to me. And, and that's not necessarily skin colour. That's not even necessarily gender. That could be socioeconomic status. That could be sort of single parent status, whatever it is. So just more people talking about issues and situations that don't necessarily affect them directly so like men speaking up for women is powerful white people speaking up for black people is powerful people from fee-paying schools speaking up for people from non-fee-paying schools is powerful so that whole allyship from all the different angles you know I'll, I'll happily stand on any platform and talk about women and, and the, the equalities that, that we don't have and the equality of opportunity more importantly and it will just be like, oh, like Sean is going on about, about women and women's issues again, oh, like pipe down. But as soon as a man, any man of any status starts talking about women's issues, it's like, oh, this doesn't directly affect him. And yet he is so passionate about it. Oh, maybe I'll like, maybe I'll have a little listen in. So yeah, allyship is, is going to be the way forward. Fantastic. The clip of you talking so passionately at the end of the Premier 15's final went viral last year. Uh, it's also featured in the film and I, I can share a link to it in the show notes. And I, I watch it repeatedly and even seeing it again last night made me a bit emotional watching it. And one of the most powerful lines that resonated with me is, this is not just about rugby. This is not just about sport. It's about women and women's sport. So I think I know the answer to this now. You've just told me, but had you planned those words before you were called to the interview? Not at all. Not in the slightest. Because first, it would have meant I had to back myself to get player of the match. Like <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a strong-willed, stubborn person, very confident in my own abilities. But never would I say, yeah, I'm going for player of the match this game in the final. Um. So so no, definitely didn't plan to say those things. But as Mum does speak about in the film, like these things are always in my head. As soon as somebody asks me a question or, or on something like that, I've got an answer for you. And not because it's rehearsed, not because I've written it down somewhere, but it's just because I'm speaking from the heart every single time. And yeah, it, it does get emotionally draining sometimes actually talking about mm. it. But when you realise the impact it's having and it's getting other people to think and getting other people to look from a different perspective and from a different lens, it does make it all worth it. And you talk about that response that it had, which was phenomenal in terms of the reaction to it. So how did that make you feel at the time? Humbled and grateful because like, I've got 24 caps for England, been part of an England team that's won three Grand Slam, Six Nations Championships and never has like my phone and social media blown up so much. And ultimately, it's not always the winning bit. It's not always the on pitch bit that really hits home. Because, you know, we won the premiership that day. Fantastic. But more importantly, and the thing that hit home to people was just those words I used. And that then drives me even on pitch. So as much as, you know, my body hurts all of the time, I struggle to get up and down my stairs on a Sunday morning. I wake up and I go coaching on a Sunday morning. I think, why am I doing this? And then I get there and I've got these 20 little girls just buzzing around like bees going, Sean, are you here? 
it like I'm waiting all week to see you and I'm like right this is why I do it or, or I get the messages in my inboxes just saying thank you number one thank you for being you or because of how you are I've seen a change in my little girl like a, a good change because of how how big and strong you girls are like I weigh 98 kilos and I'm five foot ten like, I'm not little but I will rock around in a bikini no problem and I, I'm okay with that I've got a lot of meat on me. I've got a lot of fat on me. Like I've got all sorts going on. But if I want to wear a bikini, I'm going to wear a bikini on the beach. And it's just that kind of, that visual role model that so many people haven't had growing up. And it's becoming more and more fashionable to, to kind of look every day rather than the whole, the filter situation, the Instagram filters and the TikTok filters and, you know, this perfect life. I also make an effort to not take hundreds of photos to just put one on and I'll put ones where my face looks a bit skew if I've recently noticed my eyes are a different size one's bigger than the other so I thought well I've got to point this out <laughs> it's like these real good close-up shots and I'm like look at my eyes they're different to each other and so yeah it's just making an effort to to not only be the change that that you want to see but just to get people to realize so much of this stuff on social media isn't real life and you've just got to you've got to have fun with it I love that, to be real. So take me back to the beginning for Shauna Brown. Where did you grow up and what was family life like? Ah, the beginning is actually Waterloo in a, in a council estate. Like had a great time, just out played, just went out and played all the time. Mum would go to work. Me and my brother and sister would, would go out to play for hours and hours. And then when I was eight, we moved what I thought and was told was the countryside and because we moved to Peckham. <laughs> so it's a bit further out like there's bus stops there's only four bus stops near my house instead of 10 you know this just makes it the countryside as it was at the time <laughs> so yeah and, and grew up in Peckham from the age of from 8 to 16 went to school Adian Stanhope in in New Cross um, and and started competing in athletics most importantly because of PE teachers and, and so many people in sport are, are there because of their PE teachers so I can completely relate to that and any time there was a sports competition that I could possibly enter, she would put me forward for it. And I yeah, started athletics age 12 and, and was in that shot put discus for many, many years. I went to a world youth championships, world junior championships, a European junior championships and a Commonwealth youth games. And I, I'm aged sort of 17, 18, 19 at this point, just traveling the world, realizing that my life is not, the same as everyone's life and and it, it just gives you a bit of that that grounding to sort of see see where you are in life see what you might possibly want to be but also what you don't want to be and the person you don't want to be so yeah it was a fantastic experience like commonwealth youth games in india 2008 was even now like top three best experiences in my life and I met people who were from places that are not even big enough to be called countries, like they're, they're called territories and just realizing that, you know, people live on an island with 2000 people and, and that is the population. Uh, so yeah, it just from a young age got so much perspective and, and how different people live. And you clearly had great success in athletics and field events and so on. So why did you stop? So I, I got to Commonwealth Games 2014 and that was like the pinnacle of my career. And I, I did actually aim for Rio 2016 Olympic Games, but got to a point where I wasn't improving enough in terms of my distances, like my hammer wasn't going any further. I'd made changes, I'd changed coach, I'd, I'd moved house, changed a lot of circumstances to help me throw a hammer further, essentially. And yeah, wasn't seeing the changes on the on the field. So after the Commonwealth Games, I just thought, this is not this is not for me long term. I'd fallen out of love of it. Like I'd never, I was never getting paid for it. And I always just told myself once I fell out of love of it, like I had to end it. I wouldn't want to be in a place where I just hated going to training or hated going to competitions and all of that. So before it got sort of too bad, I left. And I, I actually told myself I was going to retire from sport and be a, be a normal person and go to work and, and come home and, you know, watch TV and have dinner and go to bed and wake up. But in saying that, I wanted to be a normal person who was a commercial diver. <laughs> I went to do my diver training. But yeah, that, that normal life of no sport lasted literally two weeks. And I thought, I can't do this. I'm bored. I can't, I can't just get home from work and sit here. So I called up my local rugby club, Medway, RFC, and just said, can I come along? And they said, yeah, of course you can. 
And yeah, just started training once a week with them. That was all they trained. Um, and I was just going to mention, you mentioned being a, a commercial diver. It is fair to say you've had quite a fascinating and unconventional career p- pathway before rugby. Because uh, first of all, you were a gas engineer. And how does someone get to be a gas engineer? I don't feel it's a kind of role that a careers teacher would suggest to you. So how did, you, how did that come about? So going through secondary school, I was in a gifted and talented program and my teachers were always telling me, you're, you're going to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, but yeah, so I had that instilled in me. But then I was still growing and, and learning myself as a person and, and got to the sort of year 11 stage. And I thought academics wasn't for me. I, I much preferred the practical learning. And so I was convinced I wanted to do an apprenticeship. And it, I was obsessed with being a, an, um, a mechanic. I said, I'm going to be a mechanic. They go, hmm. You can be a mechanical engineer. <laughs> I went, yeah, but that sounds like paperwork and drawing and sitting at a computer. I'd rather be the mechanic who'd done what the mechanical engineer designed. And they go, oh. So it was almost like I disappointed them because I didn't, I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. I didn't go to any university at all. I was just applying for apprenticeships, any, anything and anyone. And British Gas would just happen to be one of those companies applied for a job and honestly to this day I don't didn't know what I was applying for I was just applying for a job as an apprentice in something um so yeah that was that was how I got a job as an installation engineer with British Gas and how long do you do that for how long were you there for so yeah in total with British Gas I was with with them five years and, and they treated me very very well like British Gas had a lot of involvement as to how I was able to make it to the 2014 Commonwealth Games and yeah I'll always be be thankful to them for that. Excellent no it's important to give that shout out isn't it of, of businesses supporting athletes and female athletes too. I did my paddy on my honeymoon 25 years ago and I love swimming but I found the whole mask thing quite claustrophobic and scary so you did move on to become a professional diver. Was that a scary thing? Yeah it was actually because even and again, it's quite a theme. I'd never really been, I'd been scuba diving once and scuba diving is very different to commercial diving. And I thought, I've just spent like a few thousand pounds on this course, this training course. <laughs> and I'm there, people going, oh yeah, like I've dived for years and I love scuba. Like how many years you've been diving? I was like, I've been scuba diving once on holiday in Egypt. Um, and now I'm here. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So I remember the first time I put the helmet on my head And you sort of lose all your senses because you're in a sill in the hat. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this. This is horrible. And you and you stand up because you're still dry and you walk to the water. And I was like, oh I really don't want to do this. But then as soon as you get in the water, it everything changes. Like it all lifts and you just feel a lot lighter and and, and very free, like like you do in, in scuba. And yeah, again, just didn't really know what I was doing there. But got through it and enjoyed it but it could it, it, it can be scary at times because so many people don't realize you can't see like I've done a lot of work in the River Thames you can't see most of the time you just have to use any other sense and when you can't see you hear a lot more and I read all these stories about they found seal in the River Thames previously and I was like oh what's that noise <laughs> But then little did I know it would be the guys on top in the, in the boat on top, like just banging things. They know I was paranoid about all these noises. So they'd get a hammer, a hammer or spanner and just bang it on the boat. Like, oh, you lot winding me up again. Like, no, nope, no, nope, no, what are you talking about? But yeah, it was, um, again, it's just one of those careers where you just have a, a good time with your mates and that's how you get through it because you go through the hard times together. And then you went on to become a firefighter too. So you, it does feel like you've picked these careers that are traditionally viewed as more male careers, or at least male dominated. Was that a conscious decision, do you think, internally to break down some of those gender stereotypes or are they just the roles that have appealed to you? It, not, not a conscious decision at all. Um, growing up with, with a mum who just let me basically do what I want, just let me do things that kept me happy, that kept me active, kept me out of the house, you know, kept me out of trouble. These worlds that that I found myself in was just me doing what I wanted to do. Like it wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a trailblazer. I wasn't trying to be the only woman in the room. I wasn't trying to stand up for women. I was honestly just doing what I wanted to do. And I knew from a young age that I could do anything if I, if I wanted to. And, and hence, hence what I'm doing now, actually rugby here, even like what, eight years ago I'd be like rugby what's that that's a sport for posh white boys not for me but yeah just give it a go and you mentioned Medway and coming through Medway and playing first there so how did you then find your way to Harlequins what was that next step through 
So I spent half a season with Medway and had my first game for them in, in December 2015. I was on the diving course. So I was up in Scotland learning how to dive between September and December and literally came back on the Friday and I was playing rugby on the Saturday. And there were Kent trials and the coaches told me, you're probably not ready to reply yet. You've only played and it's probably about four matches at the time. So I kind of left it there. And then a few weeks later, some of the girls were saying like there was not enough numbers to Kent, Kent training and they was looking for numbers. Do you want to come? I said, yeah, of course I can. It's only up the road from my house as well. So I rocked up to Kent training and not that many girls were there. Done my thing, you know, carried the ball into contact through people. And at the end of that session, the Kent coach has said, what are you doing for the next three Saturdays? You're in the team after one session. I was like, yeah, sick. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> And yeah, towards the end of those Kent, well, <laughs> towards the end of those county games, I went to watch the Six Nations, women's Six Nations. So watching sort of live international rugby for the first time, sitting there with my mum watching it, bearing in mind this would be her first experience of rugby as well, very much not a rugby family at all. And I just looked at the pitch and I looked at her and I just went, I reckon I could do that. <laughs> she went, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, I'll, I'm going to play for England, mum. She went, all right, fine. And like, it's very, how she's very nonchalant about it all because she's used to it. She's, I say, I want to do something and I go and do it. And I don't know if it helps or hinders me, but she just goes, yeah, all right, go on. That, that was the moment I decided I want to play rugby for England and then sort of look, just looking into the detail of it and what that means. And I had to play premiership rugby club and then it was about finding the closest club and, and making it work logistically with work and, and being able to get there on time, et cetera, et cetera. That becomes part of the commitment, like having to get on the road as soon as you finish work and, you know, maybe getting a sandwich down you as, as, as you're going around the M25. So, yeah, turned up to my first session and after it, the coaches went, you've not played a lot of rugby before, have you? I said, oh, no, about six games. They went, OK, we can tell. <laughs> but we can tell you you're strong and powerful and you lifted everyone in the lineup, no problem. You can catch a ball, you can throw a ball, you know, because I couldn't pass it and, you know, arguably still can't pass it. But it's the it's the basic fundamentals of sport. And they said, you're very welcome back. In fact, we'd love to have you back. Uh, we just need to teach you how to play rugby, essentially. And, you know, to this day, that's what I'm still learning is is how to play rugby. And you've become a bit of a poster girl for the sport. So you feature around the club at the Stoop. You were the face of a new Umbro uh, England kit. And you're part of a group now considering the potential for a Women's Lions tour. Does that ever feel odd to you because you came to the sport relatively late in life? No, no, it doesn't feel odd because I'm a very much a person that just go with the flow. Like things that come up, all, all the things I'm doing now, I don't plan. Like I didn't plan a little bit. The only bit I planned was playing for England and harlequins everything else just sort of comes with it and I get presented with so much opportunities it's on me to, to take it and, and and I vow to myself it's always an opportunity if I can't think of a reason why not I will go for it so it's literally I go yeah why not when I look back at not even look back like look at me now and what I'm doing I go oh she's doing all right like girl from Peckham from a, a single parent family mixed race female I think, yeah, you're doing all right, Sean. Like, keep going with it. I am honestly just going with the flow. And if people want to hear me talk, then I'm I'm happy to to talk about it. And if people want to like put me on a stage, put me on a platform, again, I, I'm happy to be that person and be the voice, be a face. Because even like you say, like my face is all over Twickenham, and me and my afro or, or half afro, whatever hairstyle I've got at, at the time, even if just people see that and think, oh blimey, there's an afro in Twickenham. I didn't realise that people who have afros can play rugby or whatever it is. It's just that kind of relatability and think, oh, well, if she's welcome here and they're advertising her, maybe I'll have a go. So maybe I'll, I'll try my local rugby club. Yeah, so it's all about that visibility and realising you can, within reason, do what you put your mind to. There's a, there's a whole lot of issues around society and privilege, but within reason, it, it, it is about just being visible and realising that, that people can achieve a lot more, so much more than what they do. Um, you weren't selected for the Autumn Internationals last year and I remember dropping you a, a direct message to check that all was well uh, and you were so gracious about the situation. Am I okay to read what yeah. you sent back to me? Okay. You said, tough selection is a good thing for the whole game and I'm okay with that. That's sport and that's the future of sport. No one's just walking into their spot anymore. The future is coming. And I think that's an incredible attitude to have of putting the good of the game above your own personal chances of selection. So 
I'm interested to know how it did feel at the time, though, to not be selected when you've been the face of so much for the women's team. Yeah, so it's that separated on pitch and off pitch stuff and not confusing the two. And, you know, I would never, ever want to be selected in a team because my face is everywhere. I would never want to be picked over somebody because I might be more popular with the media. Like, that is not the life I'm about at all. I always want to be picked on my own merit. I never want to be picked because they want a mixed race girl on the team. I never want to be picked because they want someone who speaks loudly about women's sport on the team. Like, I never want that. I want to be picked because my playing ability is far and above anybody else. So not being selected in the autumns, it, it's tough, of course, in that moment. I am angry. I'm like, I just hate everyone. Like, what a rubbish decision. And obviously, you've got people around you going, that's also a rubbish decision, which doesn't help sometimes because everyone's <laughs> going, you're better than everyone. I'm going, yeah, I'm better than everyone. But actually, clearly not. <laughs> Anybody who has succeeded anywhere in life will 100% tell you that, that nobody flies through life being told yes all the time. And I don't care how much privilege you have and how much money you have, there will be a point in your life when you was told, no, you're not good enough for, for some reason or other so yeah it's, it's part it's part of success and it's part of being the best you you have to be be vulnerable and be rejected but also it does mean our game is in a good place because like I, I'm a good player I'm a good rugby player and if I'm like I'm in an England setup and not making an England rugby team that means someone else is better than me it's been wonderful in the past couple of years to see female athletes being activists for social change. So Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, Megan Rapinoe, Serena Williams and so on. And I saw a post last week where you said, my why is encouraging women and girls to know that they are worth more. That's what keeps me going. So how do you feel your words and presence can change things for others? Well, it's when I started to realise that so many other people either don't say it out loud or don't believe it. And like they'll say... Mm -hmm you play rugby but it's, it's not as good as it like it's not as good as the men's game or and I go are you being serious and they'll say it with a smile on their face and like yeah I'm being serious and again it's back to that conversation I'm a, a paid professional rugby player but I'm one of only 30 English players in the country everyone else goes to work and so therefore you're going to make mistakes and you know shift workers who Oh, it's it's unreal the the amount of commitment that that our women put into this game who who have jobs as well because without them that the sport doesn't keep going. I, and I feel I do have to do it constantly, reminding people, like men and women, that women are good enough, and what what we're facing now is not good enough. Like people talk about equality, it's not it's not just equality; it's equality of opportunity. Again, you can talk about rugby kit, and some women will say, "Well, I want to wear men's." So, Shauna, sure, no, you're talking rubbish, and I go. No, it's about choice. If you want to wear men's, you can wear men's. I wear men's because it's just a lot bigger and I've got these huge legs that follow me around. So sometimes I wear men's kit because it is it's more comfortable, but it's the choice. I would like to be able to choose between wearing women's fit and wearing men's fit. Why not increase choice? You're clearly very vocal and very honest and articulate on many different topics, but are you ever cautioned not to speak out by sponsors or clubs or teams and so on? Mm, that's a good question. I'd say short answer is no, but I do, I, I get from other players, like, how do you get away with saying what you do? How do you get away with saying that? And I go, well, saying what? I'm just talking the truth because this is what, like, I'm not going to lie. The, the problem for people who want me to, to be quiet potentially is I'm being truthful and being honest. If I'm telling the truth, you can't, you can't keep me quiet. But then it's also that emotional intelligence of learning how to, to, to tell the truth. And it's not about almost like victimizing someone and, you know, you talk about racial issues and I would say using the word colored. So someone, a, a white person saying, oh, sure, no, like you're colored. Can you show me how to do this or whatever? But using the term colored, especially in that situation, I know that person is not trying to be mean. I know that person is not trying to put me down. I can already tell just from the tone of which they said it that they just don't know any different. So now I'm, I could, I have an option. I could jump down their throats and be like, how dare you? How dare you use that word colored? You're a racist. Nobody's getting anything out of that. But what I choose to do is go, oh, oh I don't say coloured anymore. I just prefer mixed race. And like you can say black, you can say brown, but coloured is just a no-no. 
and and then again it's how it's received some people will go oh my gosh I am so sorry like I will never do that again but equally some people go ah oh, well what's the difference it's all the same and then then we've got a different conversation on our hands but for me I've found the approach of like softly softly approach and the education and just helping people and realizing that a lot of the time like the terms we use in the speech and you know when, when people will constantly say policeman fireman like workman the tax man they don't really mean man. They just mean the person, the job role. They mean police officer. They mean firefighter. They mean the tax office. It's just that it's easy to say tax man. It's easy to say milkman. It's easy to say fireman. But just correct you go, oh, do you mean firefighter? They go, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I do. Or do you mean police officer? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. But again, equally, they go, oh, what's the difference? I go, well, if it doesn't make a difference, call them, call everyone police women. Call everyone fire women. And I go, well, I'm not going to do that. And I go, yes. And again, that's back to Steph Evans' argument with the kit. And well, I'm going to use use the man as the majority, but I can't possibly use the women to cover everybody. So yeah, the answer to your question is no, I've never been told to pipe down, but I learn emotional intelligence. I learn the situation, but no, I um, yeah, get pretty free reign because I'm my own woman. Strong, independent woman, do what I want. <laughs> I love that. I love that piece on language too, that whole ever evolving language. I was on a session recently and someone asked about cricket and the MCC changing the terms from batsman to batter. And, and I, but I wish I had, well, I will next time that, well, actually, let's just cause more batswomen then. How does that feel? That, you know, let's try that route yeah. for a, a couple of yeah, exactly. <laughs> tests and see how that goes. I will use that in future. I guess from a really positive side, we've got TikTok as supporters of the Women's Six Nations uh, this year. So how important do you think social media is in engaging new audiences for women's sport and inspiring young women and, and boys too? I think there's um there's good and bad with social media as is and how how you consume it and use it has a lot to do with how how it makes you feel. But ultimately, I think it's a good thing. It, it's about the growth. It's how you're going to get to new people, how you're going to get to new audiences and all about these algorithms that, that get you. They'll get you think, why is that on my page? I only spoke about it yesterday. We need to keep growing. And the way to keep growing is by getting new people. Over 50% of the British population is female and rugby needs to grow. So why would you only attack the 49% population? Why would you not want to, as a man, as a woman, as a supporter of rugby, why would you not want more people playing rugby? It's not about necessarily getting just more women. This is about getting more people from different backgrounds, from different perspectives. It's just all about the growth of the sport. And commercially, it just makes sense because nobody wants an old boys club anymore. Like you don't want to be exclusive you need more people because more people means more money. And from a business side of things, like it just makes sense. Sadly, though, social media can be a place that facilitates trolls and, and women's sport seems to trigger lots of those sad keyboard warriors. Have you had any abuse online, social media abuse? And, and how do you deal with that? How has that been for you? So I wouldn't say I've suffered with social media abuse as such. Like I've seen seen some of it out there and I, I don't know how, seem to avoid it. But... It's learning how to protect yourself and a lot more companies are, are taking it on themselves to, to help not only, you know, players of their sport, but employees and, and learning that there are a lot of settings and safety settings now. And, and we went through um, some of the stuff on Instagram. You could do, you, like you could, you could number one, turn comments off. You could have it, so you, hidden words. And if somebody uses a certain word on, on your profile, you can choose to not ever see that comment. If there's a new account, if the account's been made new in the last few weeks, you can choose to not, again, not let those people comment on your post. So it's part of it is us learning those safety features to help protect ourselves. But me, when I, I see sort of these minor, I literally get minor comments and it's not really anything to write home about. But if I do see them, my first response is, well, my first response in my head is I'll think of a reply, but I won't send it because it's once I realized you interacting with them is making their day. Like they are buzzing. No matter what you've said, good or bad, they're the kind of people who don't get any attention anywhere in life. And so this is their only outlet. This is the only way to get people to talk at them because you're not even talking to them. You're not trying to start a conversation, but you're, you're talking at them. And so now they've got someone to reply to. And 
you realize when these people either see the error of their ways and come out publicly and they'll talk about it and they literally say, I was just in a, in a bad, bad place and I was feeling bad about whatever situation. And so I felt a need to make somebody else feel bad on purpose because I 100% know that the comments that they're saying on social media, there's not a chance in any world they will say that to my face. And if they're not going to be able to say that to my face, then it's, this is not a conversation. This is you just, you know just being annoying and, and trying to get some attention that I am not going to give you. Brilliant. I love that approach. Um, the World Cup takes place in New Zealand in October and it would be your first. So what would it mean to you to be part of that squad? Being part of the World Cup squad would be would be the what the aim was in the beginning. So earlier I spoke about, I don't necessarily have plans along the way, but I just have these main goals and playing for England sort of tick. But now the next big plan and main goal is to play in the World Cup. And so I will do whatever it takes to put myself in that team. Um, and that's making the sacrifices. It's, you know, going through the pain of, of his body. And literally this morning, wake up, you think, oh, I can't move my neck again. And just like having to turn. And you think, well, I can't drive today because I can't turn my head. And like all of those things that come with it. But I, I want to play in the World Cup. Me, myself, Shauna Brown for myself want to play in a world cup so therefore i am going to make it happen this means having a bit of a rubbish time maybe for the next few months in terms of like body and space and you know it's, it's a different sort of mental attitude to it but i want to play in a world cup so this is this is what i have to do to make it happen and finally you've already done so much and crushed your career and there's clearly lots more to come but what would your ambitions be for life after rugby Oh, ambitions for life after rugby. Just, there's no plan. There's honestly no plan. <laughs> so if anybody out there wants to give me an opportunity to do something, I'm putting my hand up before you've even offered. But what, what, I, what I would want to do is, is the off-pitch stuff that I currently do now, but I'd want to do more of it. So I've given, I've given co-commentary a go, the punditry a go. I care a lot, a lot, a lot about you know, going out to, to workplaces, to organisations, to, to clubs, sports clubs, rugby clubs, schools, and just getting people to realise that they can achieve more. Men and women, boys or girls, like you can, you can almost definitely achieve more than what you're doing if you want to do what you want to do. So, yeah, I just really like that side of it and, and having conversations with people and hearing other people's perspectives. So, so then it makes me reflect on myself and it's this constant journey of growth. I really enjoy growing myself as a person I really enjoy change and I enjoy challenge and I I enjoy thinking you know life is not the same for everybody and and the sooner we realize that the better thanks to Shauna for taking the time to talk to me today we wish her well for the six nations and for that selection for the world cup later this year Head over to fearlesswomen.co.uk to find out more about all of the incredible guests I've spoken to for the podcast in previous series. If rugby is your passion, then look out for my previous guests that include former head of women's rugby at World Rugby, Katie Sadlier, former Scotland international and Harlequins coach, Karen Finlay, former England captain and now CFO and COO at the RFU, Sue Day, and former England and Lions player, male ally, Hugo Monnier. As well as listening to all the podcasts on the website, you can also find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a free network for all women working in sport. You can sign up for Changing the Game, our weekly newsletter, which highlights the developments in women's sport. And there's also more about my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. Thanks again to Sport England for backing the game changers through the National Lottery and to Sam Walker, who does a great job as our executive producer, along with Rory Asgary on sound production. Finally, a thank you to my brilliant colleague, Kate Hannon, who does so much behind the scenes at Fearless Women. Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook at Sue Anstis. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport. Sport.